Kate Miller and I discuss her prolific career as an actress, from starring on Broadway with Carol Burnett in Moon Over Buffalo, to working opposite Tom Selleck in CBS's Blue Bloods, to her latest role as Amanda Shaw in Hightown, Kate has done it all. In an industry that is known for discarding women after a certain age, Kate did the impossible and reinvented herself and her career in her 40s in Los Angeles, despite the doors being closed to her. But beyond the successes Kate has experienced in her acting career, she's used the hard times and the down times that she's faced, both professionally and in her real life, as a catalyst for huge growth and personal changes that she says were necessary. Her take on her life is astonishingly clear. She says, just because you don't get something you want, desire, or seeking for, it has nothing to do with your merit. Hello and welcome to At The Podium with me, Patrick Huey. At The Podium is a multimedia platform where story by story, we explore the resiliency of the human spirit with people who are using their own personal journeys to leave a positive and transformative imprint on our world today. At The Podium holds space for meaningful conversation, inspiration, and life. Today, I'm thrilled to share the podium with Kate Miller. Kate Miller is known for her extensive work throughout all venues of the show business industry. In addition to her recent roles in Hightown, Blue Bloods, The Trial of the Chicago 7, Rami, and God of War Ragnarok, she started her career making her Broadway debut as an original cast member opposite Carol Burnett in Ken Ludwig's farcical comedy, Moon Over Buffalo. She also played all the female roles in Sir Peter Hall's Broadway revival of the period drama Amadeus, starring alongside Michael Sheen. In addition, Kate has been seen in numerous soap operas, including The Young and the Restless and One Life to Live, and has been heard consistently since her career began as the Dubrie in C-Lab animated characters, notably Debbie Dubrie in C-Lab 2021, as well as countless commercial campaigns, movie and television promos, narration, and many video games, including motion capture. Kate, Hi. welcome to At The Podium. Thanks for having me, old friend. Old friend. It's taken us three years to have this conversation because I've been right, wondering. But I I was trying to figure out when the last time was that we actually physically saw each other. I think it was in New York. Had to have been in the aughts. But I know it's been at least a decade, if it's not been longer. A decade. Since I've and, seen you. Yeah, and you were one of the first persons that I met in New York when I moved to New York in 1992. Because you were very good. We have a very close friend, Toby Poser, who did the show friend. first yes. season. Yeah. So we've been yeah. friends for such a long time. And I remember, I was thinking about it today, and I was like, one of my most vivid memories of you is you playing Titania in the park at Washington Square Park. Do you remember this? That's how I met Toby, pre-Broadway. Yeah. But you know, good theater is good theater. Doesn't matter where you do it. That's my punk rock theater girl. That's what that oh. was. And then I went mainstream. You were so but good. I love that, that, that part. I, I'm dying to. I would, I would play that part anywhere. Oh. Again, anywhere. You totally and you had and you were doing this like really interesting like dance which heck you but thing with it do you remember all of this of course. <laughs> am i just weird that that stayed with i you? wish i was still that hungry wow do you know what i mean yeah. you know you mellow with age when you're just on fire with excitement and ambition and to prove yourself like you know? Yeah. I mean, because when you're when you're that age, we were all in our really in our early 20s. I mean, it was yeah. like you were doing theater on the streets of New York City. And that was like yeah. that's where it was. You yeah. know? Yeah. Shit like that doesn't really happen anymore. It's so weird. Now we have Instagram influencers and TikTok brats and oh, it's oh. so weird. Don't yeah. get me started. It'll I'll, I'll start to show my age. <laughs> those kids. Like, this those kids. Does, Crazy kids. Oh this, is, this is seltzer water. 
just in case <laughs> the glass the glass looks a little you know uh, cocktaily. <laughs> it's just water but yeah i know I, I was i was thinking about that and that was such an amazing time i think to be in new york to be in an actor because it was just like everything was on the table back then and i think and maybe it's because we are getting older everything feels much more thought through sanitized yeah so you don't it's just different culture changed culture changed because real art in culture changed we got reality tv shows we got Mm -hmm. social media you know we acquired all these things that weren't there when we were in our 20s in the 90s it's you know yeah it's just different may as well have been the 70s right that's how different the 90s are from now the 90s were more like the 60s and 70s and 80s i mean of course but like instead of the 90s being closer to the 2010s there was a shift yeah. like the 90s is old fashioned now oh yeah it's it's so funny because when 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 i hear someone talking about oh we're doing something classic in my mind i'm going to like the 1940s Sure. <laughs> that would have been classic. Right? Classics. And now they're talking about like, remember the original Mean Girls? And I'm like, oh, that's, oh my God. <laughs> I can't. I just, I can't. Yeah. That's why there's so much about this business where, like I said, I'm not sure I was that hungry. Like it's, things have just changed. It's changed. So much has changed. The strike changed things. They're not getting paid what we were all deserving to be paid for so long. Um, the, there's a lot of dignity that isn't here like it used to be. Mm, yeah. You know, networks sending you stuff to post and, and feeling obligated to let everybody know whether you're working and what you're working on and I'm on this. And it, so there's so much other energy that's infused everything. You know, yeah. I, I love what I do. It doesn't feel all the stuff around the outfit that it wears doesn't feel the same anymore. And But you've done so well, Kate, like you really, you know, uh-huh. like right through all of, I mean, those are just some of your credentials that I list. What are some of my credentials? Did you even read that thing yet? Of course. It's, it's, it's already in the can. I knocked it's it out. Can. <laughs> but you know, like, I missed it. Where, wait, where? Wait, what? Um, what, what have I done? No, but but it's it's interesting that you have that perspective because you're one of the few who've been able to break through, you know. I've broken through, but I'm not, you know, I'm still your blue collar working class actress. I'm not a name. I'm not, you know, I mean, I get seen for the big things, sure, but I don't I don't know how often I end up on a short list. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's a humble. I'm like, I'm being humble. Like, I know I work. I've oh, I've I've kind of the only time I didn't seriously consistently work was when I was transitioning and giving New York a break. I never left New York completely. Gave it a break for a couple of years. Tried L.A. My agency folded. Another one let me go. I, I showed up out of here with no representation in my early 40s when I had been working steadily for 20 years. You know, that that was a tough time. The strike was nothing like sure. It was difficult to sit around and do nothing. And you're anxious and all of that sort of thing. But when it's your fault or something about you personally, that's making you not work. Yeah. That's what drives you nuts. Like it wasn't my fault. I wasn't working during the strike. There's a strike. Right. Mm -hmm. I was annoyed by the principle of why it was happening, Mm -hmm. you know. How'd you, how'd you stick it out? Because so many people don't. Well, we're lucky. We do a lot of voiceovers too. I mean, my husband does a ton of animation. And yeah. I've always had a voiceover thing, you know, in my life. And I saved a lot over the years. And, you know, I think that when you super duper worry about things, it makes everything else go wrong too. Oh, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. avalanche of of anxiety and neurosis. It's it everything becomes oh my god yeah it's you know? it, it's like the self fulfilling prophecy thing. Mm-hmm. What was that like for you though to, to literally start your career over in Los Angeles, not the I, most big place? At I remember seeing a colleague in a big movie, 
And I'm always happy. I'm always so happy for my colleagues and my friends. And if it isn't me, please let it be someone I know and love whose work I respect. But something, I was in such a dark pit. I didn't, I couldn't get a decent agent out here for a while. No one, New York does not transfer to LA unless you are jumping out of a box or a huge name or you have heat on you at the moment. I think, is it Kathy Bates or somebody said, LA only works when you're invited. Mm. I wasn't invited. It was hard. And I saw a colleague in a big movie and not a huge part or anything, but it jarred me so much because I was expecting so much from myself. And I remember just running to the bedroom like a little girl crying. Like I just, I just, it made me break. Something about it made me break. And it wasn't jealousy and it wasn't envy about stature. It was, oh my God, I miss what I'm doing. I miss what I love to do. And I deserve that. And why do I feel so far away from it? And then everything got better. Like I left New York in 2012. I was like doing One Life to Live. And whatever other things, voiceover sort of never stopped. 20, like 13, 14, I got married and got two houses. 15, 16. So like from like 2012 to like 16, it was weird with my career. And I was trying to find my people to represent me and all that sort of thing and settle out here. But it was also a time of huge growth and change in my personal life, Mm. which I truly needed, which was why I left New York in the first place. Right. You know, gerbil wheel of actress, single. Oh my God, I'm in my early forties. Is this who I'm going to be for the rest of my life? I, I need to experiment. I think I just knew I needed to experiment. I get that way every decade in my life. I'm like, this is enough. This is stale. I feel stuck. Can we change this and experiment and see what happens when we experiment again? I love experimenting with life. You have to. You still want to do that at this point? Oh, yeah. I'm I'm ready to sell the Palm Springs house in this house. They've been on and off the market. I'm done. I want to go back east. I'm thinking about Colorado. I have so many. Yeah. Yeah. But if you think about that, think about that. You you move, you, you you have these many starts and stops in your career. And then in 2020... You win a Screen Actors Guild Award. Well, I didn't personally, You're, but the the movie I was in the gave the movie. ensemble the Screen Actors Guild Award. Yes, which is, which is like, I mean, that's kind. I of- mean, just being in a Sorkin film alone, and being in a film that was a contender at all of the major awards shows. Of course, during COVID, when I could not enjoy any of it, yeah. stuck at home, you know, <laughs> just whatever showbiz. She ain't for sissies. This is what I mean. There's always some horrible thing that you could be upset about in this industry. I won an Oscar and I haven't worked since. Yeah. It's, 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 it's everybody. No one's exempt. Mm. That's why the minute you start to feel inferior or superior to anybody, check your, it's all ego. It doesn't matter. It doesn't. The work matters. Stories that we tell and the reason we're in this business matter. The stories matter. Helping humanity. It's a noble profession when you get down to the nucleus of why we're driven. We're just the we're just the storytellers that used to be the cavemen around the campfire telling stories. We're the storytellers. We keep culture alive. We keep humanity alive. We keep, you know, Mm. morals alive. A center. Yeah. That's why I'm proud to be an actor. I don't, you know. I'm starting to get very weird about attention and I'm starting to get stage fright. Really? (laughs) Yeah. You know, I used to be absolutely fearless when I was younger and stuff catches up. Things, things rearrange, molecules change, you know? Because why, 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 what's catching up? Why, why do you think? Oh, I think any kind of suppression and, and, and emotional trauma that you haven't healed and, PTSDs from experiences or, you know, whether it's your childhood or a car accident or or what have you, I think that you can suppress all those things and, and put up a big armor and a big facade and plow through them and recreate yourself to present yourself to the world as this strong person who's fine. None of those people are, are really fine, you know? Catches up. You can't suppress something forever. You can't. You wrote, you wrote in a blog 
for me. Yeah, I did an article for Medium was what yeah. that was. I wrote it, an article for Medium. Some of them get published and some of them don't. Luckily for me, this one did. And uh, I think that's the one you're talking about. Yeah, it was, about- it was the one that was called Your Crazy Aunt. And what you said in that, and it, when I read it, Kate, I, it took my breath away. Well, all the cool people, it really moved. Most of my family, it highly offended, even though I didn't list anybody's names. But you were I speaking your any- truth. You were speaking. Oh, they, oh, yeah. That's why. That's a. This is what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Generational trauma of like, if people can't meet the truth in you, if they haven't met it in themselves. And I was inspired to write that because one of my many nieces was, I think, I don't know, fifteen at the time, maybe even younger, maybe a little older. Not legal for sure. Yeah. Saw a video of her on Instagram at some club in where she's from, I'm not going to say, I don't want to implicate anybody, like twerking and grinding on the dance floor with some 40-year-old man. Mm-hmm. And I flipped out. I flipped out. And, you know, I let I let my, her, you know, her father know and her mother. And I think even then, maybe I, they thought I was a bit judgy or something, but I, I don't, I wanted to speak to her and tell her. I have like a very strange thing with my family. Like they, they have a love-hate relationship with me primarily estranged from the majority of them now for political reasons, many things. But I wanted to impart this reaction and and everything I thought to her somehow. So I sort of did it that way when I knew I, I knew it would fall on deaf ears if I did it directly. And it also just inspired me thinking about all these other young girls that are out there in this like euphoria. I was in the middle of watching euphoria at the time. And I'm I'm blown away and horrified at how there is no innocence anymore because of the internet. None. And I just, and the Me Too movement was kind of happening at the moment. And I just, I just wanted to say some shit. Kate, you wrote this. You said, I never had, I never had children. Partly because I married so late. Partly because every man prior to my husband didn't love me. Partly because I had a very different young adult life than my family did. A very different path from most of the generations of folk that I grew up with in wild, wonderful West Virginia. I still have a very different life, you write. Some would call it a crazy one. Abusive mother, no father, half-siblings who were much older and out of the house who started having babies while they were still babies. I was an aunt at eight years old, an aunt four times over by the time I was 15. Oh, now and that number is way higher. Way higher. And like, you said, great, great aunt now. I am now a I have, great, great aunt. And some that, that you know of, you had 15, you said, that you know of. And yeah. most of them are grown, some are still growing. Too many of them have repeated and are repeating unhealthy patterns. Yeah, and I, was, I was blown away by that because I was like, very rarely do people really speak to, in such an open and vulnerable way, personal trauma and generational trauma in such a, a visceral way. I was just taken aback by that because I... I mean, I hope it moved people. It I mean, I've had women writing me on Facebook saying, thank you, I showed this to my daughter because you said things I didn't know how to say to her. And yeah. you you are you articulated things that I didn't know how to articulate. And thank you. Like, cool mm. people got it. I do think I helped some young women with that. And men, and and men I hope, too. Yeah. You know? Like, I, I, post bathing, I post bathing suit pictures on Instagram every now and then because I'm in my, I'm past 50, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I'm proud that I still feel hot in a bathing suit. But that doesn't mean I'm putting myself out there. I'm not doing that for men. I'm doing that for me. But where when is you're that young, but where is that when you're mindset? young, you can't you when you're young, you don't know the difference yet because you so want the acceptance of the male gaze or the the folk you want to be the focus of the male gaze. You want men to want you and love you, and you want women to think you're beautiful. It's all so based in ego and it's so surface, you know, and then the peer pressure of, oh, if you don't do it, you're a prude when they're watching stuff all over. How hard must it be to stay a virgin as a teenage girl these days? Yeah. Are there any? I mean. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, and you get famous from your sex tapes and, you know, it's. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I think about what you're saying too, because I remember it was a big you're deal. Remember me when I was younger? <laughs> Listen, we all have past. There's there there right. there are no there are no saints. We're all sinners, right? Oh, but yeah. you know, I just I, I just remember things that I remember. This is where we were. That Suzanne Summers could wear a tight T-shirt that showed her breasts, and people had concerns about that. Yeah. And now. You can watch any TV show on HBO, Netflix, you name it, and you're seeing breasts, you're seeing people's butts, you're seeing full-on simulated sex, and people don't even bat an it's, eye. We're we're we are numbed to that, like we are numbed to the violence. We're all numb. You become a robot, and you become numb when this is what you do with the majority of your life. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly hard not to for all of us, you know. But how did you? How, but when, when when you look back at your your life and how you grew up, and and you and you talk very open and honestly about date rape and having things done to you that you did not consent to, how how were you able to sort of move through that? Because you talk about that you had to relearn who you were, and yeah. most folks don't get that opportunity. Most folks, that's the end of the end of the story. I think that just comes from me being an actress. It's like at a certain point, and you know, you're when you hit middle age or I mean, I'm in middle age now, you know, at a certain point, as you grow older, I should say, I shouldn't put it in a age frame. You're excavating all these other characters. You're, you know, you're excavating yourself to play these other characters. You're accessing emotion. You're, you have to know yourself to be a good actor. Mm -hmm. You have to know yourself through and through your shit, your brilliance, all of it what scares you, where you're not strong, where you're the strongest, you have to know all of that if you're going to be good. Yeah. And I just, at a certain point, realized that I, I'm never going to be the brilliant actress that I really want to be, that I aspire to be, until I learn to love myself more. And look, it's a process. No one ever arrives at it all the way. I just didn't want to be, I also just didn't, people who are out of touch with themselves just aren't intelligent people to me. I just wanted to be an intelligent person. Mm. You know, I mean, oh my God, my, my like marriage and romantic relationships, forget it though. Like that's just where you're still the absolute unhealed version of you in every way. Because mm -hmm. you can't run in those situations. There's, there's nowhere to run. No, you don't have to have a mask. And when you're free enough to just really, truly be yourself, all the parts, all the parts come out and you're like, oh, that one still really needs a lot of work. I'm sorry. You know? And, but how, and how did you know? Because you, you talk about in the article that there were, there were men who just did not love you, who did not treat you right until you met your husband. Why was he the different one? What was the... I had met him... I had met him you know that I met him when I was 26 and I didn't marry him until I was 45. We were friends until our early 40s. I mean, nothing romantic. I don't know. I just felt really seen by him. Mm. The good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, I was that really rough time in my life. I was transitioning. I had a massive breakdown in front of him in his, in his kitchen. Just total crisis. And he didn't run. And there was always a spark anyway. There's There's been a spark with him since we were in our 20s. He had his own healing, growing, dealing. I think I he was a little behind, you know. <laughs> he was a big party boy for a long time. Now he's like a different person. Like we've there's been so much growth in this marriage. It's been really, you know, it'll be 10 years this year. And it's and and someone I've known for. Why? You know, you, you talk about you were really raised by your grandmother. And when she passed, your mother wouldn't let you be there with her. And there, there was a lot of there's a lot in the story about your mother mm -hmm. and what she did and what she did not do and how that impacted you. And how when she sent you away at 16, that sort of unbeknownst to you was your ticket out, was your road to freedom. Oh, hallelujah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, totally cruel to shove your 16-year-old daughter out in the world after her primary caregiver had just passed away. Harsh, right? No. 
But it wasn't like I ran off to the streets and she just kicked me out with nowhere to go. I went to an art academy. I went to one of the greatest art schools, high schools, academies in, in the country, maybe the world, Interlochen, you know? I mean, that's, oh, yeah. that's... But a lot of that was me because I was doing summer stock theater in Kentucky. I didn't want to go back to West Virginia and be there with her. I knew it was bad for me. It was harming me. Toxic environment. And I asked the artistic director of that theater if he could help me get into a school somewhere. He helped me get into Interlochen. Got me an interview, went up and met them. And my mother was supportive of all of that because she was ready to be free, you know? Have you been able to forgive her? Is that? Oh, she died years ago. It's, I'm, it's, it's a stone wall. Really? Quite frankly. Like I have, I forgive her as like a Faulknerian character in a novel. Mm. But I have distanced myself from her since I was 16. That's been almost 40 years. You know, so yeah, at the wedding, like, I don't want to go into too much because I sort of am ready to put my pain down also in my yeah. life. Yes. You can't, you know keep, I mean? can't keep rehearsing it over and over yeah. again. Like, it's over. like when you, when you learn to love yourself and you have a healthy boundary, whether it's family, whether it's friends, whether it's romantic partners, I just, I'm just not the person that can get upset about people not showing up for me the way I need them to anymore. Right. Because that's my fault if I'm allowing it, right? Like there's no more power there. I've forgiven her because I believe people all do the best they can with what they've got. Who knows what happened to her when she was younger. I'm grateful she was my mother because I like who I am. And if it weren't for her, I wouldn't be me. Right. Um, but I mean, there's there was never a connection with her. From as far back as I can remember, I never felt connected to her. I felt like she was a bad luck vessel that got me into the world. Mm. Like, truly. Mm -hmm. I hated having to bear what the energy was around, but I don't know how to, I don't know how to explain it. Thank I you. had such a village of people who loved me, like my next door neighbor, who was my piano teacher, my grandmother. Very small town, rural town I grew up in. Like, I I went where, go where the love is. I knew that at five years old. That doesn't feel good. This feels good. Like, I can't, I don't like being a victim of things. I don't like to be a victim. Mm. I don't, I don't like it. And that's a choice. Right? Yeah. I'm more a victim of myself than anything else. Well, what's most unique about what you're saying, though, is that we are in a time of victimhood being very valuable. Aggrievement. Real housewives. Yeah. Politics. Like a, like a pinky nails, like amount of anyone's life is going to be remembered. Even if you're one of the greatest movie stars that ever lived. Like it doesn't matter, you know? Mm -hmm. Do you know how freeing that is? It's so freeing. But I will go insane if I don't live in the big picture. Yeah. Like, and, and you know, you asked about my mom, did you forgive her? You know, you get older, they leave us. It, it wasn't left well. And we didn't speak for maybe a year and a half, two years before she died. Some of my family members forbade me to come home. And I, I now... I get to be with her the way I want to be with her. Now I have happy memories of her. I don't, you know, I'll never forget what that relationship was, but I get to appreciate these snippets. I, my, my mind has filtered out a lot of the negative and I remember the positive about her, you know, and that's my way of forgiving her, I guess. Mm. And that's my way of having a good relationship with my mom. Finally in my life. You know, yeah. forgiveness is a tricky thing because, I, you know, it's it's sort of it's sort of this ideal thing that we've had imprinted into our brains that we must do and we must give to people. And I, I don't know if it's that clean, which is why I ask you that, because you're really it's not and every that, that, that cliche of forgiveness is for you. It's not for the other person. The other person always thinks it's for them. 
Right. Right. You know, too many people frame it as a free pass. Yeah, it's it, not. It's not. And my my sister always says, you know, forgiveness is not the path to having a reestablishment of a relationship with someone. No, it's not. It's it's forgiving all of the shit and letting it go. What a two is it a two pot quote? Like I want to see you eat, just not at my table. I don't wish anybody any harm that did me any harm. I think that's bad juju. Yeah. You go have your life. Let's heal from whatever we've done to each other in our own private ways. Forgive and be in the now and put some good juju out there. That's what I think. That's how I live. I'm trying to live my life. That's why I'm trying something. I'm a big, like, I tend to be a big scorekeeper, or I used to be when I was younger. And and now I do it sort of in a broad sense. I just did I just did a post about like there are a lot of people that are at us in our life that want our time, want our energy, want our help. If you are keeping score with people, those are the people you need to let go of. I realized. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Uh, well, I did this for them, and I made the last three plans, and I picked up the check this last four. To- why don't why why are you here? Yeah. Why am I doing that? Why are you why? Yeah, I think there's something too as I'm getting older. I've this concept of time spent and access and reciprocity in relationships has been a thing over the past year that I have really leaned into because I I felt like in some of my personal relationships the balance wasn't there. Yeah, you, hard to find it. You're calling it keeping score, which I think our comparative brain does that. I did this, you did right. that. That's how our mind works. And I, and, and I reached a point where. I, like you, if I felt that the the balance was shifted too far towards me emotionally, physically. When you act living, like you're capable of doing everything, you often get stuck doing everything. Right. You carry the burden. You carry like John's like, you're so good at it. You know all the great restaurants. You know all these chefs. Like you're you're on it. You write people back right away. You're accessible. Like I'm too accessible. Yeah. I've been joking for years. Like my nickname for myself is Julie Cruise Director. And I'll use it as a verb. I'm like, I'm not Julie Cruise Directoring this whole weekend. <laughs> like I want to see people, but I am not Julie Cruise Directoring this whole weekend. Oh. No, I'm not your mommy. But, but you have to forgive those people. Back to forgiveness. Just because you're not my friend anymore, it doesn't mean I hate you for any reason. And I forgive the love that I, for, I forgive you for the love that I didn't get that I wanted from you. Mm. That is like, deep. <laughs> like if, if the friendship is over, it's because I did not get the love I needed from you. Yeah, I didn't get it. And I kept giving. That's my mom. That's my mother. Right? Yeah. Nope. I can't have that now. Then what's the point of like, but then what's the point of being here? Yeah. We were talking about your career in the beginning, and you say that you're a blue-collar journeyman actor, which I, I understand why you say that, because in the hierarchy of the world, you know, there's only one Nicole Kidman, right? They're not Ted. Yeah. Um, but when I, when I look back at your career, from when I, when I first really met you doing Titania on the streets of New York City to... Moon Over Buffalo with Carol Burnett, working with Jerry Bruckheimer <laughs> on your current show. It's your, he, did, he did your current show, right? Am I am I right? Yeah, it's a Jerry Bruckheimer production. Yeah, Bruckheimer production. He, he 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 was around like on a on a premiere night. Like he wasn't. I didn't really work with. Okay. <laughs> you should say four. You should say four instead. Four four Jerry yeah. Bruckheimer. But yeah. you've had you've had an amazing career. You and you you've done Broadway. You've done soaps. You've done. Movie. I've done everything short of porn and infomercials. Don't do those. <laughs> Don't do those. Although my husband says I could start a new genre called Puma. <laughs> Don't do it. Only fans. I'm like reading articles in LA Magazine about how these girls are making millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. Towing themselves out on like... A pornographic social media web, like, website. And I'm worried that I post a picture of myself in my bathing suit on Instagram. But here's the deal, Kate. Here's the deal. Yes, yes. But at some point, we all have to pay 
the fiddler his due. You can't live in a world where there are no there are no repercussions from that. Yeah. There, there, there is there is a point where it becomes where it will become too much. And I don't mean that people get their just desserts. I'm not talking karma. I'm talking right. about so the breakdown of society. The breakdown of society. That yeah. People, you know. Yeah. But my question for you was, you know, you, you you've had this really wonderful career. You work with some amazing people. And I always wonder, hey, what did you learn from some of these amazing artistic minds and and technicians and mm -hmm. also when did you know that you were that good because they're not going to put you up with somebody if you're not good because they don't have to right i learned something from everybody whether they're whether they're a five line actor on the show and they did something brilliantly or you know ms sorkin is just being in the room with any of these people it's you need know, to make up trailer next to Sasha Baron Cohen. It's great. It's inspiring. All those people just, all I, the only thing that comes to mind is I'm just inspired a lot. Mm -hmm. Whether I'm on set with somebody or I, I know somebody that wrote something that, that hits big and, you know, my friends that are doing their own thing or a fellow actor in a scene or my husband, I'm inspired by people's talent. I'm inspired by people's commitment to this to anything artistic i just i want to be inspiring like they're inspiring yeah you learn about yourself in those situations i think more than you're learning from other people i'm always very like how am i here okay there's some nervousness and st stage fright creeping in why why is that here now you know I mean, when you're working and you're playing a character, I'm very, I'm not focused on anyone else around, really. I'm in here. Lines to memorize. I have a performance to give. You know, Carol Burnett taught me stuff. Like, don't be afraid to be ugly when you're doing comedy. Make a funny face, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, things like that. But that's pretty surface stuff. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm you sure know, technique and things, I wasn't but. sure how how deeply you were going with that question. No, I'm going pretty deep with it because I, I think I think success on a certain level is is oftentimes the stars aligning correctly. But sure, but we'll also say that every single one of those huge people from Sorkin to Carol Burnett to Michael Sheen to Jerry Bruckheimer to you know other big names yeah. I've worked with. There is not an ounce of, should I be here? And that just comes from doing it so much and the world going, yes, you. There's no self-doubt. There's There might be doubt about their work, but there's no self-doubt. There's no self-doubt with them. Mm. Like they're confident in their failures. Do you know what I mean? They're confident in failure. Mm. When you're 20 and you go on auditions and you don't get it, you belabor it, you roll it over in your head again. I literally forget about these things now the minute I hit send. I, I think I think a lot of people, what I'm interested in, because and, and I think about people who played the long game in the industry. And I'm I'm always fascinated with how you manage to keep your dignity intact in an industry that is so designed to strip. You have to, like I said a minute ago, you just have to be confident in failure. Hmm. You have to know that just because you didn't get that part, it has nothing to do with your merit. If they're asking to see you read for it, that's already validation of your merit. And when you're in this enough and you do this enough and you audition enough, you know that. That's what lets you keep going. And it's fun. Everything is practice. Every audition's practice to be better, a better, a better actor. For me, anyway, it is. Um, keep the wheels oiled. You know, oh, I haven't played this in a while. Can I play this? This this character is a stretch. It's creative. It's fun. I enjoy it. I enjoy auditioning. I enjoy making my hair in little pin curls to look 1980s for something. Do you know what I mean? It's uh, fun for me. It's fun. Yeah. It's fun to audition for a role that I wouldn't normally book. Oh, that's nice of them that they see me as a character actress and that I, that I could, you know, maybe play this. Cool. I'll give it a shot. The only person I have anything to prove something like me, I I'm the only person I have anything to prove to. 
myself mm. now. That was not the case. Even in recent history, that was not the case. You know, strike the strike. Re, it gave me a chance to rewire my brain a bit. And being on this show did too. Because, you know, no matter where you look in this business, there's somebody doing better than you or worse than you. You know, you can focus on the fact that you're first string. And if you're doing that too much, you're kind of an asshole. And uh, if you're focusing on the fact that you're second string, you're you're a victim mm -hmm. and you're selling yourself short. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Do your work. That's Do your what, work. Like, um, Anthony Hopkins won the Academy Award for Silence of the Lambs. He had, what, 20 minutes of screen time total in a two-hour film? Yeah. You don't think that. We can't think that way. Do your work. Do your work. It's an honor to get work to do. That's all that matters. Oh, my God. Somebody wants, someone's going to give me a paycheck to do this. I could be in a trailer in West Virginia. This is great. Oh, my God. You know? No, I'm in a trailer at Universal. <laughs> right. Yeah. And don't you think, I don't think of that every time I step foot in my, you know, double Y. Like I just, yeah. yeah. My three banger. I'm like, hi. Wow. The outhouse is in it. You know, it's. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so Kate, on this, this season of the show, I've been talking to people about the impact. I want to talk about it. What do you feel your impact? What do you feel legacy is a big word and it means different things to different people? But what 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 are you what are you leaving? I know you say we're we're like this much of space when we go, but you're leaving something. And I wonder what I mean, you, what, this what this this recent role, I like that I get strong female characters. I think that that's a good thing. You know, I'm proud of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Like none of them are afraid to lean in and be mean and be unlikable, especially this one in high town. Yeah. It's liberating. Mm. It's really liberating, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. To play. And then the irony is is people start to like you because you're so irreverent or your character is so irreverent. Yeah. Like she's completely unlikable. She's tired. She's not glamorous. She's she's exhausted. She's pissed off a lot. She's surrounded by men. You know, she's cranky. Amanda Shaw. Cranky Amanda Shaw. Yeah. Having to work on Saturdays, listen to these dumb cops. You know, men get to act like that all the time. Yeah. Women aren't allowed to show that stuff much. That's why she resonates. Yeah. I mean, it's nice when I show up and I have something to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I think everything, every woman on that show has a very strong character. All the female characters in High Tide are really strong characters. Okay, thank you so much for doing this. Tonight. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad you did it. And good luck with this new season of the show. Yes, <laughs> the final, thanks. The final season of the show. It is the final season. Very few things make it past three seasons anymore. Have you noticed? Oh, yeah. Three and done. You guys got four. So that's because they make more money if it if it doesn't go past three seasons. There you go. The networks and those big guys. I hope I see you live in, in the desert or somewhere soon. Oh. Truly. We should really get together and do that. You will. It will happen this year. It will happen okay. this year. You look exactly the same. So do you. Thanks. So you had the long braids when I first. You had those long braids when I first met you. It's it sticks in my mind. Yeah, like, those Bo Derek braids. Everyone had the Bo Derek braids back then. Yeah, crazy. All right. Crazy. To those of you who are watching or listening, remember we all have a voice. Use yours wisely. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.